Ladies and gentlemen, we would like to begin the afternoon session. Continuing from the morning session, I, Kisawa from the Secretariat, will serve as a moderator. The title of the session is JICA's Cooperation with Ukraine. In this session, we have four presentations on JICA's cooperation with Ukraine to date, support after the Russian invasion, debris disposal, and environmental restoration and management. First, presentation by Toru Kobayakawa, Senior Deputy Director of the Office for Ukraine Crisis Response Recovery and Reconstruction, followed by a presentation by Tomomi Kimura, Senior Director of Team 2 Environmental Management and Climate Change Group, and then uh, Ukraine NCT ID Chief Specialist Mr. Kostrov Ilya, and Professor Kenji Namba, Director of the Institute of Environmental Radioactivity at Fukushima University. After the four presentations, we will have Q&A for the whole session. So if you have any questions, please feel free to post them in the Zoom chat. Please identify your name and your affiliation as well. Those who are in the audience in person, you can write your questions on paper and raise your hand. Now, I'd like to ask Mr. Toru Kobayakawa to begin his presentation. Hello, everyone. I'm Kobayakawa from the Office for Ukraine Crisis Response Recovery and Reconstruction. I'd like to extend my welcome to the guests from Ukraine as well. So I would like to talk about JICA's assistance to Ukraine. This will be the overview of our activities. My name is Toru Kobayakawa. I'm the head of office for Ukraine crisis response, recovery, and reconstruction at JICA. To first off, I'd like to share with you some stats of damage. The government of Ukraine and World Bank and EC and UN came up with these stats one year ago. I believe the actual situation today is bigger than these numbers. But these numbers are as of March last year. There are three numbers on the left hand side. We have the size of damage. In the middle, $411 billion. That is the amount of money that is needed for recovery and reconstruction for Build Back Better to recover and regenerate in a better way. So that will be the target, meaning that we need more than the actual damage amount. Last year, in 2023, in one year alone, we needed $14.1 billion. Of course, this is a big number. We have done our community. How much amount has been extended? We have the estimate. It's about half of what is needed, which means that we need to continue to provide assistance to Ukraine. Our DNA 3 is now being compiled by the World Bank. So in a few days, I believe the updated number will be presented and publicized. So with regard to JICA's cooperation with Ukraine, we have three pillars. First of all, we would like to provide support so that the government functions of Ukraine will continue. Simply put, it's the financial assistance for Ukraine to be able to keep fighting. They need finance assistance for the government functions to continue. They need funding. Second pillar is the support provided to displaced Ukrainians, both within and outside the country. There will be millions of people who are displaced because of the war. And the third pillar is the support to achieve national recovery and reconstruction in Ukraine. 
That's the biggest five. So with regard to the very first pillar for continuation of government functions, 600 million has been provided as concessional loans since last May to June disbursement was completed. The second pillar, Moldova is the target country for our assistance. Moldova is a host country receiving many Ukrainian citizens. Moldova's income level is about $4,000 similar to Ukraine. GNI is in mid-4,000 level. So that is similar to Ukraine. So Moldova provides medical services. We're helping Moldova to modernize the healthcare services so that this is going to be helpful to Ukrainian citizens in Moldova a better quality medical service is the target that we want to achieve with this assistance. So that's 2-1, 2-2. Uh, and 2-1 here on this slide is economic recovery, development policy lending. In uh, October last year, we completed the disbursement. So medical service assistance, assistance and financial assistance. Now. In this case, target country is Poland. We are working with Poland to provide aid to Ukraine. Lower left-hand photo indicates the training where we provided demining skills. As you can see, there is a mine detector developed and produced in Japan. We conducted demining training in Poland. The people in brown, clad in brown, are from Cambodia. Uh, these are the people we have collaborated for years. They have accumulated know-how about demining. We don't have mines in Japan, but due to conflicts in Cambodia, they are still working on demining the country. So Poland, Ukraine. Cambodia and Japan for countries are sharing technologies conducting this training session. Now lower right hand side you see the photograph of the training given by the Polish Japanese Academy of Information Technology, PJAIT Warsaw in the 1990s, JICA helped Poland to set up this academy. It has the technology and skills in IT. So this is the IT technical training uh, targeting displayed Ukrainians. For them to be able to find jobs uh, armed with IT skills, they have a higher possibility of finding high quality jobs. 80% of the participants are women. So we were able to contribute to higher skill levels of women. In Japan, uh, we do have Ukrainians, a uh, little more than 2,000 Ukrainians are living in Japan, Yokohama City, Osaka, Kobe City, and Kyoto. The local governments in Japan have sister city relations with the Ukrainian cities. They are very active in receiving Ukrainians, and at the same time, they are also willing to provide necessary assistance. So local government collaboration is something that we wanted to help. The photographs there are about judo training sessions. From Odessa City, the youth came to Japan to take this judo martial arts training as part of the cultural exchange. And JICA has provided accommodations for these participants. This is the third pillar. The 
like I said, this is one of the largest focal area. There are four points. Area one is laying the ground, laying a foundation for a smooth recovery. Since there are many mines still buried, it is necessary to clear these mines from the national lands. Those who are participating in training, you will be working on removal of debris. And it's not just removing and clearing debris, it's necessary to try to do the best possible processing and recycling. By doing so, there will be smooth paths for recovery and reconstruction. So that's the very first area. The second area that we focus on is improving livelihoods. There are multiple public services like energy, transport, water, sewage services, medical, healthcare, and education. Even during the war, these services need to be provided continuously to citizens. So that's where we need to provide often electricity. The power grid is a target of attack. So we are providing facilities necessary to recover the electricity and also whatever necessary to repair the road and rails for railway trains are also part of the assistant provision and water as well especially during the winter the water shortage is the severe problem so we are providing water cleaner and MRI as healthcare facility is also something that we can provide. For education, we have digital learning center for remote education at about 200 uh, locations in Ukraine. This is a plan to roll out the remote education facilities and equipment that are necessary. The area three is about industrial recovery so that they can revive their export industry. Ukraine itself will be able to run its economy in a healthy manner. Uh, so that's where we can ex uh, provide assistance. Agriculture is an important part of this industrial recovery. So it's a major part. And we also provide support for entrepreneurs, especially young people who want to set up their own companies coming February 29th, Japan Ukraine Economic Recovery Promotion Conference is going to be held between both governments. This is the conference aiming at utilizing the energy of private sector so that that can be utilized for reconstruction of the country. Area four is democracy and governance. So as you can see, public broadcasting in Ukraine. It's been pointed out that there is a challenge of corruption in Ukraine, but I think it is important for media to become independent. So check and balance mechanism for media and public broadcasting is going to be very important. So we're providing support to ensure transparent media report. Since Ukraine is under the war, broadcaster in Kiev will need branch offices. Like we do have a structure, a center in Tokyo, substations in Osaka and other cities. So that is the system's enhancement for them to be able to keep broadcasting. Lastly, improvement of financial sector. So that day, even before the war, was a challenge. So we would like to contribute 
to the improvement of the financial sector in Ukraine. Seven point six billion is the overall assistance Japanese government is providing in many different forms. It could be guarantee for loans. So all that included, 7.6 million has been committed. The numbers here are granted. You see the amount? So point, 5.7. So, including yen's loan, it will be about 1.2 billion yen. So, that's the JICA's assistance. From here, I'd like to show you some examples. First, in February 2022, after the invasion began, uh, uh, even before the World Bank assessment, we conducted a NISA assessment. We remotely, uh, through videos and other imagery, uh, made assessment of the damage and needs. And in the winter of 2022, uh, we provide inter winterization assistance because in October of that same year, uh, Russia had attacked mainly the power facilities in the Ukraine, and therefore uh, they were strained for power supply. And therefore, uh, we provided uh, power generators with other countries in Buchasi and uh, several other uh, local governments, and also to uh, power generators to uh, major energy uh, utilities. And as I said earlier, we also engaged in humanitarian demining processes and. Uh, we call this alias, but uh, they are actually mine detectors manufactured in Japan, and uh, they are um, mine detectors with uh, later uh, capabilities which can more eff efficiently detect mines. And the Ukraine has a very large territory, land territory, and so rather than checking each place, uh, we actually developed uh, these heavy equipment into mine detectors uh, uh, for more efficient mine detection. And, uh, uh, and in summer, we should be able to deliver the second batch of such heavy equipment with uh, mine detectors. They're now in the process of being manufactured. And this is the debris and re rubble removal. Uh, and uh, we can, could literalize, utilize Japan's uh, experience uh, in the recovery and reconstruction from uh, the great Earth, uh, East Japan earthquake, which we'll be sharing with the people in Ukraine. And there may be some uh, detailed explanation of this later, but uh, we conducted, a, in order to uh, conduct a pilot project with the Ukrainian uh, counterparts, so we have uh, provided uh, heavy industry, uh, heavy sorry, equipment. Also, public broadcasting is another area of our support. Uh, we had uh, people coming from the public broadcasting company of uh, Ukraine uh, to share Japan's know-how here in Japan on an invitational basis. Uh, same thing for agriculture, for example, the provision of seeds and through invitational programs. And to the right is uh, where we had that uh, mission visit the Tohoku region of Japan uh, because uh, soil contamination became a major issue in uh, the Ukraine. And so there was chemical contamination caused by the mines and uh, chemicals used. And therefore, uh, we also provide uh, soil detectors. Uh, and also in the Tohoku area, uh, we were able to regenerate the soil from a salt um, damage after the tsunami in the Tohoku area. Uh, so we showed that as well. And also we are providing various uh, support to uh, numerous uh, Ukrainian agricultural uh, laboratories. But because their land is so vast, I'm, uh, I think uh, many of you may feel that there's not much that, that they can learn from Japan, but there are some uh, family-operated uh, small 
um, plot of farming uh, farmers in the Ukraine as well. So we believe that there is room for Japan to share its uh, know-how. And likewise, uh, we had uh, the Ukrainian people come to Japan on an invitational program uh, to learn about Japan's uh, post-war reconstruction and also our recovery and reconstruction uh, after a great uh, natural hazards or natural disasters. And the photo is uh, from Hiroshima, uh, the uh, A-bomb uh, park in Hiroshima uh, to teach about how we led to reconstruction, in particular how we uh, were able to uh, generate funds for reconstruction because uh, the reconstruction takes such a long time, just public uh, money is not enough, so we needed to revitalize the economy so that we could uh, obtain a more private funding. And so that's what we communicated to the mission from the Ukraine, and we do hope to increase such uh, invitational uh, programs going forward. And this is the empowerment of startups. Uh, we would um, provide uh, uh, opportunities for presentation to young entrepreneurs, and we will also coach them, uh, provide training on how to uh, provide, uh, how to give the best presentations, etc. Now I'm running out of time, but um, uh, how to leverage the resources of uh, private sector toward recovery and reconstruction is a very key theme, and on the left hand side, uh, I've shown how we can uh, urge you, uh, Japanese uh, companies to be interested in Ukraine and uh, lead to the transfer of manufacturing technology and innovation. And on the right are Ukrainian startups and uh, big companies and how we can revitalize uh, their activities. So we need to do both. And each will, I think, uh, will have a synergy effect on each other and will uh, most likely be able to spiral into a, a synergy effect, we believe. Now, uh, from uh, this uh, February 15th to the 17th, uh, there will be a pre-event toward the uh, September 19th uh, conference to support the Ukrainian reconstruction. And uh, if you are interested, uh, please do register uh, for this pre-event. We'll be more than happy to welcome you. And we'll be inviting uh, Ukrainian startups for pitch events, also government officials uh, to talk about Ukrainian uh, policies uh, as well as their needs. And this concludes my presentation. And uh, these are photos from Hiroshima after the bombing and a comparison with the current state in, uh, in the Ukraine. Education is the key. I think uh, nurturing uh, talent, young talent, is so critical. Uh, the photo on the left is a very famous uh, picture from the Hiroshima a Blue Sky uh, classroom. And I believe that in the Ukraine you have many young people working, uh, sorry, learning remotely. Uh, so I do hope that uh, we'll be able to convey Japan's history and experience experience uh, to the young Ukrainians. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Kobayakawa. And now next, we would like to call upon Ms. Kimura for her presentation. So hello, those of you who are participating, and this is Kimura from the Environmental Management and Climate Change Group, Global Environment Department, JICA, Senior Director Kimura. And today I would like to introduce you about the JICA Clean City Initiative. So the JICA Clean City Initiative aims to promote environmental measures such as waste management and prevention of water and air pollution in urban areas and to realize clean cities and to make a healthy living environment conservation. 
in Japan went through a very rapid economic growth in 1970s, but then at that time, people were not very much regarding the environment, causing very serious environmental and health problems. Because of that, the central government, local government, citizens, businesses, and academia have now started to work together to change uh, the attitudes to, towards uh, the environment. So communicating such experience of Japan should be beneficial to uh, the developing nations, which will also lead to them creating countermeasures against, uh, for instance, the spread of bad environment. And it would also be related to the spread of infectious diseases, and therefore it is also beneficial for Japan to work in such initiatives. The JICA Clean Cities Initiative is promoting the project, and we have an aim to contribute to 500 million people in 50 countries by 2030. So not only a usual waste uh, Japan has a very extensive and intensive knowledge and know-how regarding waste management and uh, this country is prone to natural disaster uh, such as earthquakes and uh, flooding we have many experiences handling such waste uh, this year too in January 1st there was a, a very uh, large earthquake hitting the Noto Peninsula currently people are going through the reconstruction or the safety uh, issues. So the experience that has accumulated into Japan will be utilized in other areas in order for them to create a beautiful city. So as you can see, Japan is located in the center of the um, ring of fire, the Circum Pacific Volcanic Belt. And geographically, topographically, meteorologically, we are prone to typhoons, torrential rains, and heavy snowfalls, as well as earthquakes, tsunamis as well. And this chart is showing uh, the amount of disaster waste generated by major disasters. Once disaster happens, compared to ordinary times, uh, the disaster waste could be uh, much more occurring in a magnitude of orders. In During the Great East Japan earthquake, a vast amount of disaster waste was generated, and it was uh, 31 million tons. This is equivalent to a 70% of a year annual waste from the whole nation and impacted by the Great East Japan earthquake, especially in the Iwate area, compared to the usual amount of uh, waste, it is equivalent to 11 years of accumulation of waste. And in other uh, prefectures, it was equivalent to 19 years of um, waste. So once a disaster is generated, then we will have to be coping with a various type of um, waste, and that's going to be impacting the lifeline and people's living. So we must be smoothly and speedily work on the disposal of a disaster waste, because if we don't do that, this is going to be deteriorating people's public health. So removing disaster waste is the first step towards recovery and reconstruction. Uh, this is the basic disaster waste management flow. So on the very left hand, this is the disaster prone area. Once disaster happens, we have to work for life saving activity and then provide relief supplies and we have to clean up the demolition on the roads because we have to transport goods. And then we have to think about the temporal collection area for the waste. So this area is called Temporary Storage Sites, TSS, and this is a place where the disaster waste is sorted and temporarily put. Uh, this disposal of a disaster waste 
is very difficult to handle. Uh, so first of all, we have to transport these uh, waste. It should be uh, transported out of the housings and then brought to uh, this temporary storage site. And then when treating these uh, wastes in an appropriate way, then we are on the way for reuse and recycling. So uh, this is the temporary uh, storing area where appropriate treatment has been done. Storing is done and now disposal wastes are made into a small crushing and incinerated. And then sorting and separation is very important because it's making the uh, process smooth and rapid. And then it's also uh, contributing to promotion of reduction and recycling of the waste. <coughs> In Japan, uh, the, when we are finding anything that we can recycle, we tend to recycle as much as possible. For instance, for the levees and planting forest uh, during the disasters, we are doing that uh, proactively. In the Great East Japan earthquake, disaster waste was 82% and typhoon tsunami brought 92% of the recycling of the whole material from the wastes. And as shown on the top, according to the items, uh, the damaged uh, wastes were sorted out. And for metals, metals will be sold as metal resources and wood. It will be chipped and used as biomass fuel. And for concrete waste, these are going to be crushed and used as recycled crushed stone. Uh, from here on, I'm going to be talking about what JICA is doing in Ukraine for help. In the debris disposal, JICA is working with the central ministry and the six uh, local municipality, Kyiv, Mikolayu, Odessa, Kherson, Dnipro, and Halikyu are our uh, subjected area. So in 2022, uh, the aggression of Russia started uh, going into Ukraine. And as you can see, many buildings and residential areas has been damaged and many debris has been generated. In Ukraine, uh, these war generated debris are called destruction waste. So the debris contain hazardous waste as well as disastrous waste. And if the sorting is not done appropriately and then being directly taken to the landfill, then the landfill be, will be overwhelmed. In Ukraine, there is no experience in dealing with such large quantities of destructive waste. Therefore, the knowledge and expertise of Japan is transferred to the country. So next is about uh, the cooperation done so far from JICA to Ukraine. So the Russian aggression to Ukraine has caused a great amount of debris. And in order to process that, uh, starting 2026 uh, June, uh, the central government of Ukraine and local government together with JICA, uh, we started sharing our experience and we held a seminar four times online. And for this, uh, the central government, local government, uh, more than 400 people participated within these uh, trainings. And in order to work seamlessly, JICA Ukraine Emergency Reconstruction Project, a part of that project starting 23, we have been creating a pilot test in order to manage destructive waste. This pilot project includes Oh, which is which I am going to be uh, talking on the next slide. And in Ukraine, uh, the design of 
So each of the local area will be uh, needing to handle the destructive waste at their uh, hand. So JICA uh, have a testing pilot at Kiyu and we are creating the uh, design and to design a temporary sto storage sites and support for the establishment of implementation system and uh, introducing the recycling methodology of Japan. This pilot project, uh, Japanese experts are participating as well as engineers from private sector from Japan and Ukrainian Recycling Association. So this is a team of the best mix comprised of Japanese people and Ukraine experts. And for the know-how, uh, any equipment needed for, for taking away the debris is supported by Jap Japan. It, it is a grant project. So as such, uh, JICA has been uh, supporting the uh, takeaway of the debris in Ukraine from both uh, the knowledgeable part and the hard part. In JICA, along with the pilot testing, along with the central government of Ukraine and local government, uh, we are inviting those leaders in order to come order over to Japan to learn about handling the debris. So today we have some representatives from Ukraine uh, that are now they are now going through training, and they are going to be staying around two weeks, starting January 24. Tokyo, Miyagi, Fukushima, and Chiba are their destination that they are going to be visiting. And during this training, uh, MOE and the local environment, local government and the private companies will be uh, working as a teacher and all the institutions and the local government, central government's role for handling the disaster waste and how to extrapolate uh, the amount and quantity of the damages. And then think about how to treat hazardous waste such as asbestos and initiatives in areas affected by the Great East Japan earthquake will be shared by having the representatives go visit the site. So from various perspectives, uh, people will be or are underway in going through learning in Japan how to handle these debris. So at JICA, uh, the outcome of this cooperation, meaning the pilot testing in Ukraine and training through Japan, uh, the knowledge that is going to be accumulated in Ukraine and the recycling know-hows and creation of the roadmap, uh, these will be launched in the southern eastern part of Ukraine and it's going to be rolled out into the nation, and that is our high expectation. This photograph was taken in 2017, and this is how Ukraine had been uh, seeing. So this is a scenery uh, that I have enjoyed at that time, and I would like Ukraine to be going through the reconstruction as early as possible and to regain its beautiful scenery again. With that, I would like to end my presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Kimura. Now we would like to invite Mr. Kostolov. Please go ahead. So hello, dear colleagues. My name is uh, Kostrov Ilya. I'm a, the chief specialist of the Department of Technical Regulation in Construction of the Ministry of Communities, Territories and Infrastructure of Ukraine. As you may know, since uh, 2014, Ukraine faced an armed invasion by Russia. And in February 2022, a full-scale invasion began. As a result of a massive missiles attack shelling from various type of weapons, almost every day residential building, kindergarten, schools, 
critical infrastructure facilities are being destroyed and some settlements are almost completely destroyed. Even now, when I'm staying here, Ukraine is under a great missile attack by Russia, unfortunately. So before I start my speech, I would like to show you a small part of uh, destruction that Ukraine is experiencing. I could show example of destruction uh, for several days and I would not be able to show even a quarter of it, as you can see. In the photo you can see that it's a significant destruction of residential building where people were inside during the shelling. Unfortunately, as a result of the ongoing armed invasion, Ukraine is experiencing such, such destruction almost daily. In the presentation, I provide links for a few videos that show a destruction that is taking place in Ukraine. So you can uh, go to watch if you're interested. As uh, introduction, I would like to simply compare demolition waste, debris, and uh, disaster waste in Japan. What is similar is can we see between these two wastes? The generation of waste occurs in an uncontrolled manner. Most of the waste is mixed, which complicates the waste management process, generating a large amount of waste in a short pe period of time may contain hazardous waste. There is a slight difference in the composition of such waste. As you can see in the slide, concrete bricks and plastic predominate in destruction waste in Ukraine. But the main difference is that demolition waste can be contaminated with explosive objects, mines, shells, etc. So after the mining, the approach to managing demolition waste and disaster waste are the same, like in Japan. This is why Japan's experience, Japanese experience is particularly useful for Ukraine. On this slide, I would like to highlight the experience of regulation waste management and disaster and demolition waste management legislation in Ukraine and Japan. As you can see, the experience of Japan in the field of uh, disaster waste management is more than 20 years compared to Ukraine. Today, Ukraine has a short deadline to implement the bin long-term global experience, including the experience of Japan in the field of waste management. Now, I like to present you the overview of the current situation with debris management of Ukraine. This is also demolition in uh, Kharkiv city. To begin with, I would like to draw your attention to draw your attention attention to the approximate destruction scale in Ukraine, as a, is a beginning of the February 2024. More than 280,000 damaged bills and structures, including multifamily buildings and apartments. More than one of hundred thousand buildings beyond repair. More than 600,000 ton of debris at the temporary storage yard yet, but necessary to say that the millions of ton of waste have not yet been accounted for, which are the in temporarily occupied territories. As for the challenge, we are currently facing this vast extent of destruction challenging to evaluate before military activities cases. Difficulties is managing debris in war affected areas, shortage of for skilled workers in communities. Communities and government have limited resources for destruction after mass, hazardous materials mixed in debris. In general, debris have harmful effects on environment and public health. We understand it. Why we're here. Thank you for 
such experience. Based on the results of training in Japan, we, identif we identified a wide range of problems and challenges that we will face. In order to organize the process of managing destruction waste in Ukraine, the Cabinet of Ministers of Ukraine adopted a resolution uh, of, establishment, of establishing a procedure for managing of waste arising from damage destruction of buildings and structures due to military action, to terrorist acts, sabotage, and their consequence management works. In 2022, September 27. Actually, very long name of its resolution. Uh, the short will be the debris management resolution, if, as we say in Ukraine. The main objective uh, stipulated by legislation is to mitigate the lesson of environmental and health impact of such waste recycling destruction waste components for reconstruction use. Uh, this you can see on the slide, the definition from the cabinet of resolution is a little bit complicated. What does regulation define? Standards method of assessing and recording debris volume and type. Identification and tracking system for such waste. Debris classification based on origin, contents, and hazardous material presence. Guidelines for procession destruction waste. Local government protocols for debris management. Arrangement for temporary storage yard of significant debris amount. Basic principle recycle of debris in construction and building materials production. This is all that re uh, those re resolution provide, as I said before. For the recycling needs, we distinguish so-called primary and secondary materials. The annex uh, of Cabinet Resolution 1073 is general established list of waste component and their potential reuse in construction in, in the building materials industry. Primary such as components like rubble and parts of structural elements, door and windows, filling utility networks, etc. The materials is concrete, concrete, brick, plastic, wood, glass, metal. The secondary is the materials and items found inside or near the structure during the damage of uh, the small things such as uh, equipment, personal items, house, household goods, for furniture, organic materials. I want to admit that in general established list of waste aligned with the EU's list of waste according to decision 532. 532, sorry. Management of demolition waste involve a set of organizational and technical measures and work operations carried out of ensure environmentally safe collection, transportation, sorting, shortage, treatment, utilizing, removal, neutralization, and disposal of soft waste. The coordination of destruction waste management it carried in Ukraine by authorized body, our local authorities. Actually, this is the scheme according to our resolution, how uh, the, the manage uh, with the breeze is going, H how this process is going. Actually, it's very, very simple. I go to the next slide. Uh, also, placement uh, decisions for temporary storage yard are made by uh, Kiev city and other regional administration. Uh, so to, to place on their territory temporary storage yard, they 
need a special decision on the local level. Procession operations are limited on to, to no hazardous main waste components involving compering and separation, crushing, and factioning. Now, according to the cabinet resolution, storage of destruction waste can be operated during material law and for one year after its end. Now, we understand this is a very, very optimistic timing, so we will uh, change our legislation according to our experience that we already had. Again, according to the cabinet resolution, destruction waste temporary storage yard include areas for temporary waste storage and sorting, processing, uh, which include recycling, and sorting secondary raw materials, crushing sorting facilities, and other installations, temporary structure for waste management activities, and also have minimum sanitary protection distance as you can see. According to the cabinet resolution, destruction waste temporary storage must meet the following sorry, <laughs> requirements, uh, like a solid level foundation, accessible entrance, enclosed perimeter, proper elimination, and uh, actually, the fire and special vehicles access necessary is uh, must be organized there. It's also prohibited to storage for destruction waste outside specified temporary sites or facilities, mixing different destruction waste during storage, sorting other waste at destruction waste site. The first practical step in management of destruction waste was a pilot project implemented in Kyiv region in Borodyanka. The project is coordinated by our ministry within the framework of emergency recovery program between the Japan International Cooperation Agency and the government of Ukraine. The project envisages the construction of a temporary storage site for the waste from the destruction with the placement of processing lines talking into the best practice of Japan. The project also provides for the transfer of the necessary machinery and equipment, including crushers, loaders, excavators, as the previous lecture say, you could see it. Also help provide to Mykolaiv, Odessa, Kherson, Dnipro, Kharkiv regions. There are still a lot of challenges in the field of destruction waste management in Ukraine. The main problem is, of course, the continuation of the air motivation in Ukraine. Today, authorized entities, local authorities need to facilitate IRA cleans, temporary waste storage, manage waste volume assessment and plans, determine the final and technical needs for effective waste management, adopt recycle technologies for usable waste, seeking international support because uh, uh, actually uh, the state budget almost the half or uh, Ukrainian state state budget goes to the military needs. Of, uh, unfortunately, this is true we live in with. Central executive bodies need to create guidelines and legislation for construction products from recycled waste, evaluate data from local governments, establish incentiveness for using recycled waste in construction, determine founding needs and sources, secure international aid, set the goals, KPIs for waste reuse and recycle pre preparation. Of course, the business and community involvement is very important. I would like to note that uh, this slide was made before we visit Japan, which uh, result in a 
broader understanding of the next step for us. Uh, actually, now we're working on our action plan together with local authorities, with uh, Ukrainian Agency of Recovery. So actually, our understanding are now more wider. Ukrainian strays for a critical economy, including the recovery process. On this slide, I try to consider waste of destruction and an up opportunity that arise within the framework of the circular economy. Actually, uh, starting from the left, with a large amount of waste from the destruction. Next, we go to the efficient waste management to lessen environmental impact on destruction waste storage yard. Processing and utilizing of demolition waste as a result, converting waste into reusable components. After that, secondary raw materials preparation and then building materials production. Then process of reconstruction, construction works, and generation of construction and demolition waste. And again, the circle going. So experience of Japan that could be implemented in Ukraine, adapt to debris management in Ukraine, is of course the regulation and legislative level of disaster waste management approach of the interaction between the state and local government on the issue of disaster waste management, approach of the development of local disaster management plans, approach to sorting, processing, and reuse of disaster waste, requirements for special and personnel involved in the procession of disaster waste management, technologies for processing and reusing large volume of disaster waste, integration of electronic system and products into process of disaster waste management. I also like to note the my colleagues from Ukraine delegation are here with me today. The knowledge and inspiration that we uh, bring back to Ukraine will undoubtedly play a great role in processing of rebuilding the country and created a better and sustainable future for our people. I want to say uh, thanks words for Japanese people, for Japanese government, for JICA, for Japanese ministries for supporting us. Go siecho arigatoga zamasta. Sorry, I'm trying. Arigatoga zamasta. Thank you very much, Mr. Kostorov. And now next, let us call upon Mr. Kenji Namba. The floor is yours. This is Namba from Fukushima University. And today, I'd like to share you about what we have been doing on our project. So this is the project that I am working starting 2017 April, and it lasted until March 2023. And I was working as a PI, uh, meaning that I was the principal investigator. So we worked within the project with these members. And Fukushima University uh, leaders and researchers are main people. And Tsukuba University and Fukushima Prefectural University professors are also participating as researchers. So I myself oh, have been staying 
in the area for 100, 123 days uh, working for the project in Chernobyl. This is uh, effectively uh, before COVID. And before COVID spread, uh, I have been frequently visiting Ukraine. And this is the chart for our partners in Ukraine. In total, there are 12 research institutes that we have cooperated together. So uh, this area, this organizations, uh, these are governmental organization. And SNRIU is State Nuclear <coughs> Regulatory Inspectorate. And SSTCNRS is working for the movable radiology uh, monitoring system. So in emergency, uh, this device will be able to uh, be portable. NISS is working for the nation, and this institute is making judgment for the nation itself, uh, working directly under the presidencies. And Sausium, uh, I think people already mentioned this organization at the Chernobyl in the no-go zone. These institution, this is a governmental organization, and this is called the State Agency of Ukraine on Exclusion Zone Management. And then there's Echo Center underneath Sausium, and another one is Ecological Biosphere Reserve Organization. On the right, uh, left-hand side, CGO. Uh, this one stands for Central Geophysical Observatory under the State Emergency Service. In Kyiv, the aerosol uh, is measured in air. So these are the radiation that uh, travels in the air, and they investigate uh, such uh, observation. And UHMI is uh, analyzing the hydrometeorological information, UIAR. Uh, this one is one of the Institute for the Agricultural Radiology for Ukraine underneath the Ukrainian University, RPI. is about radiation evaluation. So they mainly investigate on radiation protection of ATS in Ukraine. INPPS uh, it stands for Institute of NPP Safety. So for the nuclear power plant, uh, there's radiation emitted out and uh, the modeling and the monitoring is done by this organ. And IHB is working and researching, studying on the hydrobiology, IMMSP. Using computers, they launch various simulators. And for us, we were working with the modeling for the radiation that travels via the river the IGS. Uh, this one is about uh, the under uh, the groundwater. They're in charge of groundwater monitoring. So those are the partners that we have been partnering. And IGS is part of the Science Academy. So all these institutions are participating within the SATREPS project. And such a large group is very rare. So today I came from Fukushima Direct. So people from Ukraine, I heard that you already went to Fukushima. And it is, in effect, not that far from Tokyo. Uh, this is the Fukushima Daiichi uh, nuclear power plant. And I'm just expanding over the Fukushima area. So Fukushima University is located around 80 kilometers away from the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant. And in the Great East Japan earthquake, there was an earthquake tsunami happening. And as a result, the nuclear power plant has been shaken. And then the radiation started the contamination of the air. And this is 
covering the whole air and space of Fukushima, especially in the eastern, uh, eastern north area. The air was contaminated densely. So this is a picture taken at Fukushima University. It's uh, actually the campus as of 2018, December. So our campus itself was going through the decontamination. The surface of the soil has been uh, taken away, removed. And underneath uh, the ground, we were digging holes in order to store the soils. However, this day we have been excavating, and maybe you might have already gone about all these excavated soil was transported to the interim storage facility. And so our campus was also hit by uh, the incident. So this is the institution that I work as uh, the leader, the principal of the institution. And uh, this is a map of the whole University of Fukushima. The university is not that large, and uh, the number of faculties <coughs> is around 230. <coughs> and the research center in 2013 after the uh, nuclear power plant uh, uh, incident, we were established. So the building has been uh, established later on. So all the members working with us, uh, this is the member of today for the IER. <coughs> they all participated since 2013. So a dedicated personnel there are seven who are uh, perpetually our member and there are several five people who have some terms working for us and for the science uh, department there's nine people from the science department and nine and i'm one of them is also working for this ier and uh, where we have highlighted in red, uh, these are uh, professors from Ukraine, researchers from Ukraine. Mr. Mark Jereznyak, uh, he is now a visiting associate starting November 2013. He has been the very first non-Japanese uh, working with us, uh, so he has been the a successor of uh, Professor Alexei Konopuriov. So uh, once he had to retire, but then now he is still with us and he is still in Japan working with us. That was about Professor Mark Jelesniak. Uh, to the Satorips project. I would like to talk about the background, why we were accepted to go on start with our Satore project. So in 2011, uh, the uh, Fukushima accident happened, but then in 1986, uh, there was an accident in Chernobyl. And 25 years after the Chernobyl incident happened, So what, 25 years has passed, and then our accident happening happened. So what is the significance of this 25 years in between? Maybe we might have to think about 25 years ahead from Fukushima, uh, observing Chernobyl. Maybe we might be looking, observing uh, the condition of the future of the Fukushima in 25 years ahead. And our end stance or radionuclides so it's a chemical format of the radionuclides and maybe the format could be changing or else during the environment the biological effect could be happening from uh, the movements of the biological uh, life and radiology could be moving traveling along with the travel of the mammals and plants and then there's another significant meaning for 25 years after Chernobyl accident happened. During this 25 years, there was tremendous technology developed, computer in, as well, and then the chemical analysis, analytical technology, or else uh, how to measure the radiology and mass metrically. 
it's the ICPMS has been developing uh, significantly. And then there was also a UAV, the unmanned vehicle, the drone, has been uh, developing significantly. So all these new technology uh, has been adopted and used at the Fukushima accident. It was not a technology that was existing when Chernobyl happened. Therefore, within the 25 years, the technology has been developing is what we can say. And our interest was that during Chernobyl and Fukushima, uh, comparing the temperature or the precipitation topology, uh, many conditions were so different. And by those differences, uh, many things turned out differently. Uh, for instance, the hydrological uh, substances flowing in the river, or else maybe the erosion of uh, the geography has been different. And by the difference of the erosion, maybe the travel of the radiation became different. There's another great differences, significant differences. Uh, the, in between Fukushima and Chernobyl, the radioactive nuclide with the two was totally different. Fukushima had a long life, a radiation a cesium that had been going out in the air, and plutonium and the radioactive strontium has been um, released into the air from the Chernobyl. So chemically wise, uh, scientifically wise, we were very interested that there's so great contrast between Fukushima and Chernobyl. And lastly, the government policy of Ukraine and Japan is rather different. So the uh, control of the accident area, accident site was different between the governments. That is going to be detailed in the next slide. This is in 2015, January, when I first went to Chernobyl. The other one, it says, there's a typo, and this is taken around 2019. This is a gate going into the uh, controlled area, controlled zone, and it is a very sober place. But at that time, we had a souvenir shop, and a touristic touristic bus has also come after this 2015. By not having people go into the uh, district, Chernobyl was trying to maintain the safety. However, they changed the policy. And in the case of Japan, we had various infrastructure added, and then we tried to bring back people, those who were working in the site, and also bring back the residents. Therefore, the policy between the two nations are different. However, looking at Japan's uh, policy, maybe uh, Chernobyl would be impacted by how Japan has been leading their policy. So this is the photograph of the souvenir shops. People are enjoying Chernobyl goods and ice cream sold at the site. Now coming back to the project itself, so that is how we started the project. And the Satoreps So I would like to just mention what it is. Uh, JICA and JST is running the program. And JICA is uh, positioned as the uh, support of the development backed by the government. And the JST is now working uh, jointly uh, with, with the two nations regarding the science uh, perspective. So while working scientifically, the uh, research and policy of the partners or pun partner country will be supported. That is the uh, framework of the project. And the project is could be de developed in four teams. One is the cooling pond. 
It's about the districts, and one is about cooling pond. Uh, the uh, cooling water, which is warmed within the nuclear power plant, will be discharged and will be cooled in the cooling pond. And it was about 10 kilometers, 10 times 10, uh, 10 times 2 kilometers size of pond, excuse me. And then second was about the zoning of the no entering zone. So uh, what is going to be located in which area? Uh, those were the issues that we were thinking within the zoning issue. And the third was about uh, the monitoring modeling of long distance dispersion through atmosphere. So uh, from Chernobyl to Kyiv, it's about uh, 10 kilometers far, excuse me, 100 kilometers far. So uh, during this distance, we were observing how uh, these uh, dispersion was made. And then uh, summarizing, we try to make the recommendations to the Ukrainian government. So this is the uh, cooling pond that I've been mentioning on the first point. And this was the accident uh, where the nuclear power plant played. And then the water is cooled and then it's discharged here within the cooling pond. And then there could be some vaporization. Uh, the water will be pumped up from the nearby water in order to feed in more water into the pond. And after 2000, when the nuclear power plant stopped, halted, uh, this water intake was also continued. However, in 2014, uh, this pump was destroyed. It was broken. Therefore, uh, Ukrainian government just uh, made a decision not to mend this uh, pump. Therefore, the Chernobyl is now heading for uh, dismantling. And then uh, this is now along the way the pond is changing its uh, its view and in 2020 IAEA has been instructing the government in order to try observing and to enhance the monitoring of the cooling pool and we helped out that too and then the groundwater transportation was also monitored the water quality of the cooling pond, especially the, for the radiation strontium, uh, has been rising in concentration because of the water scarcity. And what is going to be the impact is what we are discussing currently. So the possibility is that the uh, groundwater, thinking about the direction of the water flowing from the NPP, Mm, the water is coming, flowing out from the NPP is what we consider. Uh, but then the hydrological uh, Japanese side and the Ukrainian side, scientists are both working jointly. And then in the cooling pond, there's many fish that habitate. The big one is this catfish. It's two meters long when it's getting big. And this is a bone in the ear of this fish. And when we look into it, we can understand the age of the catfish. When the catfish grows two, e uh, two meters, do you know how old they are? And we were surprised to analyze that they were 40 years old. And it was a pity that we had to kill such catfish for research because they lived so long. But anyhow, uh, at various institutions, uh, their organs are also preserved and meaning that 40 years they've been living so they've been living through the chernobyl accident too and looking into those uh, bones we are now assuming that we can analyze what impact they had through the chernobyl so i'm sorry i'm running so fast but this is the water quality and what it impacts to uh, the water habitations, water visitations in Ukraine. And these are uh, rodent species that were captured around the area and nearby forest and the nearby area where the low uh, visitation is seen. We've been 
trying to catch these rodents every year and try to understand the differences by ear. So that is what is indicated within the pie chart. And then when there's new land, there could be some much more diversity, biodiversity increasing. However, the rodents, we went through the assessment of radiations and the impact of radiation. Uh, the Japanese um, animal researchers and uh, the Ukrainian animal researchers also worked in uh, conjunction. This one is about zoning on the second topic. And the aim of the zoning is following the policy of the Ukrainian government. So to create a new industry within the Chernobyl uh, controlled area, for instance, installing solar panels, or else maybe work on the wind power generation, or else uh, radiation waste management, have some storage. All the uh, nuclear power plant uh, generated waste could be brought over to Chernobyl was the uh, policy of the government. So for Fukushima uh, residents, we were sort of uh, surprised at that uh, decision. However, including tourism, we need to have the radiation level controlled strictly in order to have visitors coming in, therefore, for the zoning. Uh, these were the very new area where new way of usage for the Chernobyl uh, no enter zone will be used, used in the future. For instance, this is the research we are working on. This is the area where forest fire happened. And then looking into the soil in limited area, we analyzed how much precipitation will be transporting the soil and radiation after a large precipitation. So after the forest fire, we understood after our analyst analyzation that soils will travel so widely. So in this case, we use the drone UAVs to estimate biomass in the forest. We have conventional methods compared to UAV. You can see the relationship is clear now. We know this is very effective. By having this biomass estimate, we understand how radioactivity is stored in plants and how this is going to be brought into the air in case of wildfire. And this research will provide important information to scholars in other areas. With an exclusion zone, we conducted this test using potatoes and apple wheat. And we try to compare that to Japan. Carrium concentration is lower in plants in Ukraine. Potassium is lower in Ukraine compared to Japan. And this is the airborne radioactivity being tested. Meteorologists are participating in this research. Now, the schooling pond is now dried. There may be radioactivity airborne. There may be some coming from reactors. There may be additional radioactivity coming from the wildfire. So we set up monitoring equipment for observation. This equipment is placed within a cage. You might wonder why it's not because of the bear attacking. I heard that equipment can be stolen sometimes, so you have to have this type of physical protection. Uh, 
the area where we have research, we know that wildfire occurs almost every year. And this is in April 2020 during COVID-19. And this one is quite large. This is cooling pond, and this is where reactors are located. And as you can see, radioactivity is transported toward west direction. And we believe that there is a possibility that radioactivity spread due to this fire. And we had a local observation, which worked very well. We also had observation equipment in Kivu, and meteorological prediction is indicated here. And there is a airborne radioactivity transported close to Kiev. We believe that the, this prediction accuracy is pretty high. This is group four. Their activities are indicated here. We have researchers from Ukraine and government officials. They were invited to Japan so that they can go on a tour to Fukushima, especially in 2018. Ministry of the Environment of Ukraine and also the head of the Ukraine at Chernobyl exclusion zone came to Fukushima. They also visited the Ministry of the Environment. And we had good discussion. And also, there is the Renewable Energy Research Institute of AISD, which was established in Koryama, close to Fukushima. They visited there too. They also studied the reconstruction led by local governments. Itate Village is an example that they visited. And more recently, this was the last invitation project, October 2019. The director of exclusion zone, a deputy director, came to Japan. He visited Namie, Futaba, Okuma towns. We have some photos from that time. Reconstruction policy and the state of reconstruction were the topics of discussion. And there was a prefectural research institute, National Environmental Institute. There have been environmental creation centers set up by the prefecture of Fukushima. Uh, we actually organized a tour to visit different places in Fukushima. And this is one example of research by Kataoka Ita. He has been the coordinator. Our research actually began even before JICA set up its office in Ukraine. And Mr. Kataoka was stationed in Ukraine. And he looked into the laws that are related to Chernobyl. He actually wrote a paper out of that. And as you can see in this timeline, our project started in 2016. Officially, it was adopted in 2017. Relaxation of exclusion zone is something that we believe that we have brought impact on. And in some of the laws, there is a mention of our research project. Another thing, another factor that I should mention here is the success of our project. In the third country, uh, what you see here is the UK team. This team has been interested in U uh, Chernobyl. Uh, they had this iClear project. In the west of Chernobyl, Narovich, 1991, after Ukraine became independent, five millisieverts was the natural average in that area, even if outside the exclusion zone of Chernobyl. And citizens in that community may have seen what was happening in Fukushima. They were wondering if there is any possibility for them to be able to return back to their original community areas. 
and they started a discussion with the government. And this UK team was sort of a mediator. And we actually participated in the discussion introducing the uh, lifting of evacuation uh, in Fukushima. In February 2022, JST News introduced our activities. This was publicized in January in the same year. And immediately after that, the Russian started to attack Ukraine. And this is in April, Ukrainian government officials entered exclusion zone. They have taken photographs. We received those photos. As you can see, all the computers were destroyed. Memory and hard disk were stolen by the Russian soldiers. Uh, we assume that they have stolen those memories and the hard disks for them to be able to earn little money. Now, inside the exclusion zone, there are ex uh, monitoring posts that are indicated by dots, and you can actually see the real-time dosage. This is March 3rd in 2022. This is where Echo Center is located. Excluding this center, observation was not available, that the information was not available, perhaps due to the computer destruction, uh, maybe because of the uh, electricity blackout. So it's very difficult to continue monitoring. If you look at other photographs, as I showed you earlier, that souvenir shop looks like this now. And this is the restaurant outside exclusion zone. It looks like this right now. And we were hoping that we could find something that we could do to help. Satraps, Chernobyl project. We believe that computers were in shortage. For them to be able to continue their research and monitoring, we decided to donate computers. And monitoring system, we provided the movable detection systems. And we asked for uh, JICA to provide the donation worth over 20 million yen. This is a ceremony. Uh, we had the uh, ambassadors of both countries participating online. Of course, uh, JICA uh, official made a speech there. Uh, this is a photo I took in Ukraine. Uh, uh, we actually had a exhibition of the photographs that I took in Ukraine, and I actually planned to have one event, but I was invited to do the same in other cities. And uh, the money that I was able to earn from that photograph exhibition was donated to the Ukrainian embassy. This Chernobyl, Chernobyl project and the subtrips, we had this last meeting in Warsaw. We had the Warsaw meeting. It's not just our project. Other radiological researchers from other countries participated from safety perspective. We try to examine what is the situation in Ukraine, which is still under the attack of the Russian army. We shared information and including us, participants from different countries. We're introducing ideas how to help Ukraine, the technologies that we would like to bring to Ukraine to help. This is Zaporizhia nuclear power plant, which was to be attacked as of 7th of March. We started our activity of research. We asked the related ministries and government organizations. WSPD is the prediction system. And 
Rodos is the German university's prediction system. Utilizing both systems, we try to simulate what could happen if an accident in Zaporizhia nuclear power plant occurs. And we actually do this every day, today as well. And we provide the simulation result uh, as information, provide that to Ukrainian government every day. Compared to Chaika's project, this is a small contribution, but uh, this is a Ukrainian researcher. Uh, within Satrep's project, we receive a researcher as a trainee for her to be able to uh, research chromosome or NRI. We also have the doctorate students from Graduate School of Science from Ukrainian University. She came to Fukushima University, continuing her doctorate research. And other Ukrainian youth contacting us, we are hoping to provide scholarship. We are trying to provide information for those young students to be able to come to our university and study. This is my last slide. I repeatedly said this today. I'm a principal investigator, but I am also functioning as the research coordinator. As a result, in both countries, researchers in multiple uh, disciplines continue to work together. The collaboration still continues on. And as I mentioned earlier, local coordinators help was enormous. Japanese community in Ukraine, uh, especially Mr. Kataoka, Uh, when we were sending large-scale analysis equipment, we were able to do this thanks to the information we get from uh, trade company employees living there locally. And also JICA, I just want to extend my heartfelt thanks to JICA officials for the great help. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Namba. Now then, although we are a bit behind schedule, we'd like to move on to the Q&A session. So we, would like, we have questions for all four speakers. So let me read out the questions in the order of their presentation. So if you could answer them one by one in that order, please. So the first question is to Mr. Kobayakawa. Thank you very much for your presentation. The private sector development ecosystem you showed through a chart, but in supporting Ukraine, what are your expectations and hopes toward the role that the Japanese private companies can play in helping the Ukraine? Thank you for that question. Well, when we talk with the Ukrainian government officials, they expect economic support, including ODA, plus private investment from Japan. That's often cited as a requirement from Japan because uh, uh, the local transfer of Japanese production and manufacturing industries to Ukraine. The Ukraine is what they're looking for. Of course, that can't be done overnight, but uh, uh, they want to locate manufacturing industries along with um, maybe uh, power and other companies. Uh, and this, of course, generate employment in the Ukraine. And uh, so incorporating the advanced technologies will help to increase their economic growth. 
And uh, I guess those are the expectations. So we have to take this step by step. Uh, we have to uh, have the Japanese companies know about the Ukrainian market. And the next step would be to match make with the respective Ukrainian partner companies. And of course, it'll be some time before uh, we can enter the Ukraine for such activities. But uh, we would like to engage in such step by step development of bilateral ties uh, toward that ultimate goal. Thank you very much. So next will be a question to Kimura-san. So with the support supporting Ukraine, uh, Japan is now supporting to make reconstruction and we understood that the experience in Japan, disaster uh, experience has been leveraged. That understood. And how is it, is it going to be possible to link all these experiences to the um, waste uh, proce processings in uh, Ukraine or recycling industry uh, growth within the nation? Is that possible? Thank you very much. Uh, that is a very grand topic that you have questioned me. So truly, uh, the Ukraine, the recycle uh, rate was 6%, very low for recycling before the war. Therefore, uh, the country has yet to work for recycling. However, going through uh, the uh, debris collections and demolishing waste, we have been introducing what recycling is. Therefore, going forward, we are thinking what Ukraine can start from and then to lead it into a recyclable-oriented society. Uh, we would like to discuss it together jointly. Thank you very much. Now to Mr. Kostrov. What sort of efforts or initiatives are necessary for Ukraine to utilize the knowledge and experience gained from Japan over the long term? And what do you expect from Japanese governments and private industries? Actually, we already uh, have support from uh, Japanese government, but actually we're looking into develop this cooperation. First of all, we understand that we need uh, a little bit uh, change our legislation, make some long-term and short-term plans, and uh, acting according to that plans with cooperation uh, with uh, in cooperation with local authorities in Ukraine, with cooperation with uh, business and uh, scientific institutes. As a, am my answer or? Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Kostrov. Lastly, question to uh, Namba-san, uh, Professor Namba. So the academia between Japan and Ukraine, we found your presentation very significant. And the Japanese side, uh, we understood from your presentation that researchers and coordinator from the Japan side has well intensive knowledge about Ukraine. And you are now having some exchange students from Ukraine. And we understood that your supportive system is good within the school. However, how are you, what is your role going forward in order to build Ukraine as a country? Regarding the area for the environmental radiation. Not, uh, I cannot, I will not say that uh, there's not much people from the Ukraine side who has been uh, growing as a human talent to work in that sector. Uh, therefore, going forward, Ukraine has been going through the Chernobyl incident and we have in Fukushima. We both have uh, the mindset in order to be ready, be prepared for any disasters going forward that could or might happen and all these ex ex uh, experience will be needed with other nations as well. 
So with the cooperation between Ukraine and us, Japan, what we can do is maybe we can be preparing for the next uh, nuclear power plant incident that could happen in any other countries. So the younger generation, younger researchers could be having a great role within that sense. And when I would like to talk in a more uh, recent issues related to today's presentation, uh, the radiation, when it is took or people intake the radiation through food, then it is going to be impacting and health of people. However, in the level of people not being impacted by the radiation, we are able to analyze the radiation. And so based on our knowledges, maybe, for instance, we could be contributing to fertilizers, food, not using radio radiations or radioactive technology. For instance, using tritium, the natural tritium, when it goes into the natural water, the water is no longer used for serving waters. But if we use some specific analysis, we will be able to understand the um, how old the river is, and then that will lead to how safe and possible for the water services to be provided. So the environmental radiation research, other than being prepared for the nuclear power plant, we have also a role to play. So younger generation could play a significant role in those areas. Thank you very much, Professor Namba. have already gone over time. Uh, we asked only one question to each presenter, but we'd like to thank all four, pre uh, four presenters for answering the questions. Thank you very much. So we'd like to conclude the Q&A session now. Thank you very much for your attention.